This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. In each episode, we bring you information, insights, ideas, and interviews from some of the industry's top thought leaders. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic and guide the show. This is Media Sales Mastery, the podcast for media sales professionals. I'm your host, Jamie Wood. Our topic this fortnight, generating new revenues. So why this one? Well, no matter how successful you currently are, the reality is clients leave. Budgets contract, spend moves to other channels, businesses get acquired, businesses close. Quite simply, business is change. Now, some of the leading media organizations globally still only benchmark their client retention year on year at about 60%. So if 60% of advertisers return year on year, that's a win. And that's kind of interesting when you think about what this means for us as media salespeople. It's for these reasons that we actually need to make sure that new business generation is always core of our sales strategy. And anyone who's been selling media, particularly in the past 18 months, would be acutely aware of just how vital those new revenues are and the ability to uncover and identify where those pockets of opportunity exist in the market. You know, how to really build that targeted plan to engage those advertisers and then how to deliver a compelling proposition that gives them a compelling reason to invest with you. It's probably never been more important than right now. And I think even over the next 12 to 18 months, it's going to be increasingly important as media companies look to rebuild their revenue profiles and bounce back. So our guest today is George Bushman. He's the founder. He's the CEO of Boost Media International. Now, these are these guys are the leading media revenue generation consultancy globally. They are very, very highly regarded in the industry um, by many leading global media publishers, um, some of whom I've spoken to on this podcast before. I'm going to let George give you a little bit more background on Boost, who they are, what they do, and the formation of the company, but excited to get into this topic around generating new revenues. The first five. George, welcome to the show. Thank you, Jamie. Pleasure to be here. We were just having a chat before we pressed record, and obviously Boost Media is a company I've known of for a while. We've we've had the lovely Joe from Boost Media on the podcast in the past, but tell me a bit about the last 18 months in the world of Boost Media International for you. What, what, I suppose, has the last 18 months been like, and probably more beyond that, what's the background of the company? You know, what what caused you to found the company, um, and where are you sort of at now? Um, first, I guess a little history on the on the business. I had the pleasure of being involved with the Triple M Australia Group for about fifteen years, and um, ended up um, managing each of the stations over the time, and being sales director of Sydney and Melbourne, and then also held the role of national sales director. So, always had a clear passion for the industry, but always very much focused on the sales piece, um, which obviously broadened out over time. And then, um, almost the same amount of time with Macquarie. Radio, where we built um, CGB and TCH into a very, fairly formidable set of stations, albeit just in the single market in Sydney. And again, very sales focused, um, you know, gradually, even before we made the massive step of hiring the, the new teams of Hadley and Jones and et cetera, we managed to turn those two stations into profitable stations and they hadn't been for decades. So, always loved the sales side of the business, um, but keeping an eye on programming and and the business end of it as well. Through that period, it was always clear to me that chasing new business and keeping the portfolio of customers broadening was really the key to the business's success. And finding new business is always a challenge. So over the years, I've (laughs) always prided myself on running fairly tight sales departments. Um, Even when I was general manager or chief executive, I used to send sales directors crazy by interfering and messing around. Basically trying to keep everybody focused on the fact that we could all sit in boardrooms every morning and come up with excuses why we can't achieve things. And certainly COVID's been the latest round of that set of scenarios. Um, But those that actually go out and prospect and look after their customers and, you know, stay focused on the job at hand, which is to actually go and get more advertisers for whatever medium you've got, are always going to prosper. So, in fact, the start of Boost was that through the years at Macquarie, we actually had a, a thing called the Macquarie Club, which was a very basic revenue generation model, the same as the old NRS style of, you know, talk to some customers and bring them into a room and sell them a package. 
We did, however, take it to a different level, which was it seemed to me that it was pretty stupid to talk to your own customer base and offer them discounts, albeit you're committing them to a 12-month plan. Um, you're basically just cutting your own throat. So thankfully, for some reason, I came up with a plan to, and I'll call it generically advertise to get advertisers. From the very early days, even at Macquarie, we used to send um, massive direct mail out to markets, to whatever market we were operating in with the promise to come to an event and, you know, in 45 minutes we'll explain how you can build your business by using the miraculous power of radio or whatever, whatever thing where it is we're selling. So that was the germ of Boost. Um, I had, you know, as you, you know, 25 odd years happily in the broadcasting business, decided to step out um, at about 45 years of age, which is probably about 20 years too late. Um, but I just enjoyed the jobs I was doing, so it seemed to be an easy place to stay. Um, got Macquarie to a very nice place, um, had the pleasure of being a, a shareholder in it, so I had, had the opportunity to take some cash and build my own business, and that's where Boost was born about 15 years ago. So that, that was the germ of it. Um, it's always been based on very large-scale uh, event-style expos, if you like, and that's why traditionally across the world we, we deal with the biggest media companies on earth. So it's, you know, it, it's impossible really to take the boost model to one radio station in Kentucky or, you know, uh, one newspaper in Singapore. It's, it's always the big groups because the expo piece is, is extravagant. Um, and think about it in terms of an upfront for television. Um, it, it's a huge event and these events go for a week and they're held at, you know, large either auditoriums or five-star hotels, and we showcase um, the media company's assets that we're selling, uh, run a very sophisticated audio-visual presentation which handles, you know, why people should advertise on a particular medium, and importantly, case studies, and, uh, and then we literally sign people up on the spot. I think the reason it's been successful is that it's not in any shape or form really cold calling because all of our marketing to get people to attend uh, is all based on explaining that they're coming to buy a package of media. So it does tend to take the tire kickers out of the, the equation. So it, it, it's been brilliant, um, it continues to grow. And then this little pesky thing called the pandemic sort of turned up. Um, interesting, I was in the US in January 20 and um, was just, it, it was just at the beginnings of it. Um, I was in New York and in fact traveled all over the US to all of our clients. And as, as that sort of trip or visit continued, there was just more and more news and more and more stuff about this strange virus that was coming from China. And by the time we got back to Australia, it was in late February, it became evident that we were gonna be in a bit of trouble because we're an international media company that travels around the world. Um, mm -hmm. puts thousands of people into hotels together to transact media packages and uh, that was going to come to a fairly abrupt end. So I think the thing that put us in fairly good stead, and I to this day don't really know what, <laughs> why I came to the conclusion so quickly, but we actually went to all of our partners and we suggested that we pull the programs and in that February, for example, we had something like 35 events pending over the next 120 days um, in terms of turnover for us, you know, tens of millions of dollars. And by pulling everything quickly, it meant that we could um, put some of the staff on hold, stop our expenses pretty, pretty quickly, and, and that literally saved the business. Concurrent with that, which was a deep breath moment, um, we fast-tracked our move to virtual, to a virtual platform. and. Um, very proud to say that within literally 90 days, um, we had constructed a, a, a virtual version of what we do um, and had sold it into pretty much all of our key customers straight away because they all needed the revenue too. And then also went on a merry chase to start putting that product into, into more businesses. Um, and its key focus when it was first developed, the product was called Boost Now, was actually that to for media companies to utilise it for their sales teams whilst they're at home in lockdown. Um, mm -hmm. so, so we fed leads to this platform and had a, a really nice operating system up very quickly that allowed people to transact on the platform. 
Um, so that was phase one that literally allowed us to keep the business rolling, put all the staff back on for the time and away we went. In fact, we had our first income from the new product in July 20, which was pretty incredible from a dead start to literally it was four months from when we pushed the button on building the platform to when we actually started driving revenue from. That's now developed further to a new product called Burst Virtual, um, which is really a replica of our live events where the only difference is um, that the customers don't come to a venue, they literally make an appointment to have a virtual presentation. And that presentation now takes the form of pretty much everything that happens at a Burst Live event. So it, that, that's been a transformational piece for us. In fact, we've got some customers now that may never actually return to live events um, because the virtual piece is working so well. The other advantage for our media partners is that the costs are, are considerably less too. So, um, in fact, our Singapore client media corp are actually running the program twice a year now instead of once a year because they, they don't have the, the costs of the venues, etc. So, we've now got the three products, Boost Now, Boost Virtual and Boost Live. And um, with the markets opening up, we're in business with all three of them, which is terrific. It's interesting. It's like a forced adaptation, but it's actually made you diversify the business and the product in a way where you can sort of what, so you've really got you've got kind of three distinct kind of sections to the business now as things open up, which will continue to operate concurrently. Very much so. So the Boost Now product we actually run completely remotely, so we yep. can run that in countries that we wouldn't typically operate in. Boost Virtual is uh, is softer touch, but not not completely so. And then of course Boost Live is our normal business as usual. So um, you're right, and in fact, you know, proudly we actually we just had. That the year just finished is actually a record year for us. So to, to actually come out of the pandemic, pivot the business, and I hate using that word pivot because it's been over years, but we pivoted the business and actually came out of literally from a dead start with no revenue, you know, 14 months ago, 15 months ago. We actually had a record year in, in financial year 20, so at 21. So it was um, quite a journey few more grey hairs, but you're right. I mean, we now have a stronger business because we have the three pillars. So now when we're talking to customers around the world, we can offer three different um, alternatives, which has made us more robust. It also, I think in my mind, was an interesting inflection point because you're like, operationally, these big scale events are very difficult to run in COVID, but there's probably never been a greater need in the market to generate new revenues um, and to really, you know, have these media organisations be able to deploy some programs to be able to sort of fill up that new that new business pipeline which is kind of the segue into what we're we're talking about today George and we're going to get into the weeds we're going to get very tactical and this is about what a salesperson selling media at the front lines can apply this week but I guess the first thing I would ask is you know your business exists in large part to deal with these massive global media companies they're still re- relying on your expertise in terms of generating new revenues. What are the hidden challenges and why is generating new revenue such a difficult practice for media organisations? I think there's a, there's a range of answers to that, to that question and I'll, I'll take them in, in, not particular, in that particular order. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, pandemic or not, things are getting more complicated for all major media companies. Um, and whether that's the onslaught of digital or, you know, the reality of life. The the interesting thing that we see from a global perspective is that at the very time where people need, media companies need to generate more revenue, they're all under intense pressure to reduce costs and headcount. So yeah. that that becomes complicated, right? Because at the end of the day, the only way to continue to grow your business is to have more arms and legs out there on the road, um, you know, doing the job of, developing new business. Um, so you've got two, two different problems here. A, you've got an enormous amount of great excuses for people not to perform, and there's less people to perform those duties. I mean, there's you know, very few media companies on earth that are expanding their teams or reducing them. So the reality is we need to start to focus on finding the right customers for your media and coming up with reasons for them to advertise because it cannot be about price. I mean, it, the moment in any sales um, situation where you start talking about either your product or the price at which you can sell it, you've, you've now lost the advertiser because yeah. 
They just don't care. You know, I, I used to, it horrified me over the years walking through our sales departments, which were all always tremendously successful sales departments. But you'd hear, whether it was direct salespeople or, or even, you know, the agency teams talking to the, you know, the, the agencies, you know, have you heard about Alan Jones's ratings or have you heard about how, you know, Doug Mulray's up to, yeah. to 14 or 15%. You're probably talking to a, to a car dealer who's just had his, you know, managing director on the phone screaming at him because he's got 400 demo last year models sitting on the floor. Frankly, he doesn't care what Alan Jones's ratings are. You're not solving his problem. Sorry to cut you off there, George, but I'm just nodding vigorously here. You can't see me in the studio, but you know, I um, I, I just I've, I've had this conversation the other day and. The example I use is, you know that annoying person you meet at a party who just wants to talk about themselves all night? <laughs> um, nobody wants to hang with that person for more than about five minutes. And it's it's such a good call out, mate, that we get hyper-focused on our product. We get very much around our differentiators, our USPs. And what we really miss is that we're not making the client the hero of the, the story or the conversation. It's um, It's very much got to be about them and their objectives and their sector and challenges. Or solving his problem, right? So, you know, for, for a, a quick, just a quick anecdote. I mean, I had the pleasure of, you know, running Alan Jones for, for many years. So there were times he had a twenty percent share, and you'd hear our sales team saying, "Alan's got twenty percent of the audience." I would actually conversely look at that and say, "Well, that's fantastic. That means eighty percent of the audience aren't interested." In it. So I'm not sure what twenty percent is. Leaving that aside, you know, I have often used in training sessions around the world. The thing about, you know, call a car dealer, do a bit of research, drive past a dealership, see that he's got a ton of stock from last year. Call that guy up and say, do you want to, you know, (laughs) did you know our disc jockeys are the best disc jockeys on the planet? The guy's just not interested. If you say to him, Mr. Jones, I've actually done some research and your dealership's beautiful and notice that you've got 45 um, Ford Festivas that are last year's models. And we've had done a workshop at our at our radio station and come up with a way for us to sell those cars for you how long do you think it's going to take to get an appointment to see that guy yeah probably not going to be that interested to have an appointment to see you to talk about how great alan jones's ratings are but he's probably going to be pretty excited about selling those 45 cars if you've actually got to come up with it if you've come up with an idea now that of course the you know the difficult part of that is you actually have to have some business acumen to figure out how you're going to sell those cars for the guy but at the end of the day at least you've got his attention so you know fundamentally Look, there are a million reasons why, and the pandemic pandemic's given uh, you know uh, uh, people in in media companies uh, even more excuses. There's a million reasons why people shouldn't advertise or people can't go and make sales calls. But at the end of the day, you just need to relax and prioritise the, the the advertising customer for once, and make sure that your conversations are all about them. You know, and then you'd be surprised how you might actually start to sell some more of your inventory. Another interesting thing that I certainly did as a young sales guy, which kept me in fairly good stead, was focus on verticals that you actually understand something about. Yeah. When I started in in radio sales at 2SM about 400 years ago, I had no idea what I was doing. It was the classic example of, you know, the sales director who was out to lunch every day, left the yellow pages on my desk and said, off you go, young man. So... I did a couple of things. First, I went and bought a Sony Walkman and a set of speakers, went upstairs and met the guy who made the ads and begged him to make ads for me as demos, which apparently you're not supposed to do because it's a waste of time. But I, in my naivety, thought, I don't understand how I'm supposed to go and sell this. I've got nothing to sell. So I need (laughs) need an ad. And bizarrely, because I used to sit, uh, it was, Auto Sun and Air was the first customer I ever went to see, and I made this ad, which was completely wrong. But at least it got the customer talking about him and his product and telling me how wrong I was with the information I had, rather than sitting there having a debate about whether the ad should be $150 or $175, because it just doesn't matter, does it? I mean, does the unit rate of the ad make any difference to the conversation if, if they don't believe they're going to get a return? So I stuck with... Things I understood. I understood cars, so I went and got all the motor racing tracks around Australia. I understood snow skiing, so I had a snow ski client 
north of Sydney, south of Sydney, in the CBD and out west. I just focused on bits I understood. So when I was talking to the customer, actually, I could speak in their language rather than some language I didn't understand. So again, you know, fundamental tip, but just focus on things you actually know something about because it's a bit hard otherwise. It's funny that you say that because I, I mean, I obviously started in radio sales too, indirect sales. And one of the things that I used to find really helpful was prospecting in particular categories. Yeah. But using every phone call as an opportunity to learn something about that sector. So, um, you know, not interested in seeing you, Jamie. Stop calling me. <laughs> Stop harassing me. I don't want to meet you. Okay, no probs. Understand. Hey, just out of interest, what's the seasonality of your business? Like, when are you busy? When are you not? What drives it? What type of customers do you service? The next phone call. Hey, I understand your category usually starts to kick in autumn, um, and you typically serve these types of people. Would like, you know? It it just builds this level of acumen that you can then start to leverage to at least speak in the client's language the way they speak about their product and service. It's a very important skill, that business acumen, and it's something that takes time to develop, but it's a, it's an important, I believe it's a very important thing to have because otherwise you default to your product because that's what you know and what you're comfortable with. Um, and that's a safe place for people, isn't it? Jamie, you're so right because, and, and this is problematic because it's very difficult to teach people common sense and business acumen. But um, at the end of the day, if you don't have some understanding of business, you can't do this job because you think about, you know, as you're prospecting and you go to the scoop shop, right, because you know that, you know, that you know something about that industry. At the end of the day, the spare shop operator is probably going to say to you, but uh, the season's over, like I just, it's, it's August and, you know, the skis are gone. You need to then be able to pivot straight away and say, yes, but Mr. Jones, you don't shop you know, you're not shutting the store in, in, in Pitt Street for the rest of for the next eight months. So let's talk about selling snow skis to Australians who are going to jump on a plane and go and ski in America. Let's talk about selling your hiking boots because that's what people are going to do in summer because the, the store is full of things other than skis because otherwise they literally mm. have to shut their doors. So you have to be able to, as a, a media sales professional, start to think about how does this person's business work? Because if you don't, you can't do with the objections, right? That's right. And I know you you know Josh Busteed very well. He's a guest on the episode and a friend of mine outside. Um, he had a great quote. I spoke to him the minute the pandemic hit. And I remember he made a point of saying, you know, the sales team need to be prospecting relative to those who still have a need in the current environment that can be met. Um, so it's not about the 85 clients that can't be active or have an excuse. It's who, where are the pockets of opportunity and where do those parts of the economy um, that are ticking over, where, where do they exist and how do we target them? And it's probably a segue into the main topic. Media sales mastery. If we want to get really tactical, I'm a, you know, I'm a media sales person. I've just been handed down my budget for the quarter ahead. Um, I've got a gap of about 30% that I've identified I'm going to need to generate from new revenue. Um, and let's you know take that with a grain of salt because obviously some sales cycles are much longer and um, and whatnot. But let's say I've got a gap of about thirty percent to my budget that I need to hit over the next quarter that needs to come from new revenue. If that was you, George, what would be the first couple of things going through your mind? What might that initial planning process look like for you? Probably all of the above again. I think I think you need to be aware of your surroundings and what the market is doing. Um, because, you know, you're prospecting, particularly in light of this craziness of the pandemic, this is going to continue to change and the focus will change. To, to your exact point and Josh's point that in any hostile environment, um, there are businesses that do well and those that aren't. So you, the first thing you got to do is be very aware of what is going to happen, right? And and what what are people going to be spending their money on? Who that There are certainly things, there are categories that you, there is no solution to. So, you know, through COVID, really wasn't much point chatting to, you know, hotels, travel, you know, all those sorts of things. But as for, you know, home renovations, hardware, you know, the, the list goes on and on. Restaurants pivoting from selling seats in restaurants to selling home delivery. You, you have to be aware of, the, of what's going on around you to try to figure out what, what where you go next. Um, but, but then I do, do think you still stick to your knitting and try to stay with of the verticals that are relevant, you know, the ones that you know something about. Just thinking about, I suppose, what, and I know we were sort of not going to just completely talk about what Boost does, but I'm interested to know, 
boost process of coming into a media organization do you do you typically do an audit of the inventory and kind of go you know how do we sort of package this in a way that might be desirable and valuable to a particular industry um really good question the the answer today is very different to what it would have been two or three years ago the reality yeah, right. of life is that media anyone that's in the revenue generation business and, and i'd have to say i wish we had more decent competitors because there really just aren't any um, there is still there's a gaggle of the smaller mum and dad type businesses that do the traditional you know 30 radio spots a month for 12 months and you know th- th- those people will always exist and they have a place you know for the smaller media companies we, our product now is now completely bespoke so we don't actually do any pre-packaging um, we don't sell redundant space we don't do any of that what we sell is campaigns and commitment levels so that if you come to a boost live event now or a boost virtual event what you're buying is a, a commitment level of you know fifty thousand a hundred thousand up to a million dollars of inventory there are incentives for you to, to make that commitment and then we then sit down with the customers uh, post the event and actually work out the campaign so if you're a if you're a a business that's about to launch a new product, you might use that entire commitment over four weeks. You might not spread it over 12 months. So the whole old way of doing revenue generation is sort of out the door. Um, and that allows us now to work a lot more with the independent media agencies, larger direct clients, and even some of the consortium agencies um, globally. So we've kind of changed that whole dynamic. So. No, we don't really sit down anymore and think about what what parts of the inventory are relevant because we believe that no one buys no one buys that way anymore. So everything's bespoke, everything's built on campaigns. Yeah, which is something that can be translated to a media salesperson who's sitting inside a, a company and kind of looking at a particular industry vertical and probably just thinking about the types of inventory they might have at their disposal and how to best deploy that how to package it the reason i was asking that was because i would imagine the 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 media publishers that would engage your type of service have a remnant inventory that they need to commercialize like that's kind of i feel like that's a big part of the reason they'd engage you but obviously what the market values is is somewhat more around that bespoke option yeah, the, the answer is yes, but bizarrely, by sell, by bringing each of these media companies, you know, between 50 and 500 new customers, they actually use the inventory anyway. So Yeah, yeah. I know that might sound a bit strange, but whether or not it's redundant inventory or not, if, if we can increase a media company's fill levels by 10%, you've actually done the job. But it, what, what the reason this is important is that it means the campaigns work. Yeah, it means the campaigns burn because many of the traditional revenue generation models, you might sell a whole heap of stuff at the beginning and then you know, halfway through the process it stops burning, which is a, a pain for us and for the media company. We have become a, a source of new business, but it's business as usual. And it also means we don't have this need to heavily discount um, because we're not pre-packaging up what would be seen as being redundant inventory. Yeah, and that, that has probably been my experience with doing sort of new revenue drives is that it's great to convert the new revenue. It's always fantastic, but it's the nurturing and servicing of the account, particularly in that sort of 90-day period yeah. initially to ensure that the campaign objectives are set and, um, you know, and that there's a retention strategy. What are some sort of, I guess, some strategies or some tactics that you would recommend for a media salesperson to... You know, they've onboarded a new client, they've generated the new revenue, they've got the signed order, but what what does that kind of nurturing and retention process need to look like in that initial stage once the revenue's been won? Sure. And look, some of these things are going to sound incredibly basic, but ultimately, if you want to be honest about it, most media companies don't do the sorts of things I'm about to talk about that I'm sure you do in your every day. So for a start... As you've already highlighted, managing expectations is the main thing, right? I mean, a lot of our yeah. new ones think that they're going to run an ad and, you know, suddenly their, their store is going to be chock a block full. And, you know, I've often used the analogy that you need to keep the campaign running. I mean, I want to meet the person that's driving down Parramatta Road in Sydney and in the first time they hear an ad for the local Honda dealer, that they drive straight to that Honda dealer and go and buy a car. You know, 
at the end of the day, that Honda deal has got to be their advertising um, consistently so that when that client, uh, when that um, consumer is in a, in a mood to buy, then it's top, top of mind. Um, we then go through, uh, in our boost world, a lot of training with the sales teams on retention because this is the key thing, whether it's business as usual or our programs. And we actually set what we call 12 point retention plans. So every month we try to coerce our media partners, sales teams into making contact with the customers on something that's got nothing to do with trying to sell them anything. Um, and that can be as simple as an invitation into the into the, the media company to meet with management to talk about a business plan for them. It can be literally movie tickets. It can be bringing the kids in for work experience. We, where our programs work best and where we have retention levels in excess of 90% is where the, these 12-point retention plans are refreshed every year and um, are, are maintained. And I think we all understand that, you know, when you've got a, a big prop in the market, the temptation is to call the client and find out how they're thinking about, you know, what, have we got an answer yet? All irrelevant and stupid because if the client had an answer, they would actually call you. My philosophy is always find reasons to talk to your customers, nothing to do with what it is you actually want to achieve um, and just stay, stay with them, you know, and you've got to make these customers feel they're getting a result because let's face it, a lot of media is, it's very difficult to actually ascertain whether they're getting a result from your piece of the, the puzzle. I mean, I don't need to requote all those great old sayings from the past, but people really understand which bits of their marketing are actually generating the results. And I, I just think you just need to ensure that the advertiser is continually coming up with great creative to engage with their customers to make them relevant. You know, the, the messaging is important. Um, so I think manage expectations, make sure you talk to these customers constantly. Let's face it, a lot of salespeople are so worried that the client isn't getting a response, they don't talk to them and then it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. The client disappears because there's no contact, right? Because the yeah, rep doesn't want to hear the bad news. If you stay in people's faces, find silly reasons to talk to them and visit them and just keep on coming up with great, parts of their portfolio to advertise, it's going to have a fairly better chance of winning than not really communicating with them. It's a really good call out. I, I actually can um, think of a few occasions where through the duration of my career, we've done sort of bigger partnership deals with an advertiser. And one of the things that's always been really handy is building in some different pieces of, um, let's say, value, right? So okay, we've done the media transaction, we've locked in for 12 months, we've booked the plan. Um, but as part of this, we've also given you some access to research or we've given you a couple of additional pieces of re uh, inventory, like some content or in you know the old radio days, like some live crosses or um, you know some different kind of ways to refresh your creative. Really being able to have those additional pieces of inventory or those additional partnership entitlements and really leveraging them early in the piece. So there's always a new VBR to go to the client. There's always a new thing to be working on just to keep their engagement levels in the campaign high throughout, you know, throughout that initial period where perhaps there is a bit of nervousness. Are we getting the leads through? Are we getting the phone calls? I'm surprised how, yeah, you're absolutely right, George, how, how few sales teams actually have that as part of their sales process it really seems to be right up until the point that we get the deal, we've got a pretty clean process, but there isn't a whole hell of a lot of strategic retention plans in place off the back. No, and, and that is the case for whether it's a boost advertiser or whether it's a business as usual advertiser. We're all very good at getting the business and so we're all notoriously bad at monitoring that business. And Because as I say, I think the biggest thing is we all hate rejection and we don't want to pick up the phone or drop into the client because they, they might tell us it's not working and we don't we don't have enough confidence in, in our ability to be able to manage those objections. And, and let's face it, sales is all about objection handling. So again, you know, it, it's the idea piece. It's the, you know, with the creative, have a creative execution that builds over time so that we set these expectations. So 
if you're talking to the betting guy, don't go ramming straight out with a sale. Let's build the guy's brand for one or two months and, and, and thus let him understand that we're not trying to fill his store up in the first 60 days. We're trying to get to the point where when the market then starts to hear specific offers, they at least know that the client exists and well, the advertiser exists and that they've got some credibility running. We've got, and if you set a parameter of time for what, you know, if you if you take the time to go through a creative plan with them, then they're going to feel more comfortable about that because we're not lurching left and right. We've actually, we, we all understood when we started this that it's going to be a three-month plan or a six-month plan. And these are the different creative pieces that are going to happen within that period, right? So the panic won't set in quite as quickly. I mean, I'm in the world of out of home these days, and it's an interesting area to explore in the world of COVID where the market are buying very short term, very transactionally, but we're afforded opportunities to really build a campaign that has different components and parts. It's it's actually really enjoyable to work on. Um, and I've you know, you can feel a level of engagement from the customers and the clients when you build out a strategy that rolls out over six months, twelve months and has these different milestones and these different creative executions. Um and I'm I'm really you know I'm really optimistic that we're going to start to move back to that that mode of um, planning and buying and selling media sooner rather than later too because there's an appetite from the market to you know to get out of this kind of short term tactical trading behaviour that we're all sort of fallen into you know new revenue George it's interesting you were talking before around you know retention plans and really new revenue doesn't have to come exclusively from new advertisers like there is absolutely a a case to make for cross-selling upselling growth of existing accounts i suppose the question i'd kind of have is what what kind of role can incremental revenue play in growing revenue size and are there any tips for a bd salesperson in terms of how to look at their client portfolio and identify those opportunities for growth yeah, I, I think, again, it's about not looking at the obvious and it's about doing some homework on what that customer's doing because the best sale you can make is to a customer you've already got, but expand to other divisions within their company or other brands or other services or, in fact, even help them develop other services, right? So, I mean, you know, when you think back to the very beginning of lockdown um, in, in Australia, restaurants weren't doing home delivery, right? Well, some genius decided that there's a, there's a way to start keeping those kitchens busy and keep some staff employed. So, you know, we really need to, again, be an asset to our customers and sit down and come up with ways that they can expand their offering. And thus, they've got more things to advertise. So it, it's just not taking the blanket approach and just look at, you know, what the obvious easy steps are take the hard route and understand the client's business and help them develop their business so they've got more to advertise. It's a good segue into the listener question, which we've got here too. I can't ask my sales manager that. And I'm going to read it out. It comes from uh, a gentleman in Ottawa in Canada. Um, Really sort of dovetails into what we were talking about earlier. So his question is... Hey, I just found your podcast and I love it. You know, I um, I work for a TV news network and COVID has really impacted our, our revenues. I was talking with my sales manager and her and I, uh, you know, decided that I need to be identifying new advertising categories. So I usually just target businesses that I think are good matches for the audiences that we have, but um, I haven't really focused on an industry vertical before. So do you have any tips on how I might approach this one? Thank you so much. What's your initial thoughts reflecting on that, that particular question? Is that fairly common in your experience? Yeah, I guess that it sort of falls into the habit thing a bit, doesn't it? I mean, people tend yeah. to have um, their go-to vertical. If they, if, if, if they don't really realise it themselves, they probably fall into habits of the types of customers they like to approach. Um, and I guess in its simplest form, you know, whether it's, I don't, I don't know what the target audience of this TV network is, but if it's a younger Channel 10 style audience, obviously he'd be targeting the you know, the particular businesses that he feels are appropriate. There's nothing wrong with any of that. Um, but I guess this just does come down to, you know, the simplistic answer is he's got to look at what the market dynamics are considering, um, as he's already mentioned, COVID. And what I, I'm, I'm never so concerned really about the type of audience profile within reason um, because you've got such a diverse range of people consuming any media outlet really. So it's more about the right advertiser for the time rather than worrying about so much the right advertiser for the medium. Yeah. 
So you're you're really thinking that, um, particularly in broadcast media, I suppose, where you know even when you do have a a demographic that the publisher might target, we are talking to still these big these big audiences, these big broadcast audiences. So it really is more about identifying which categories might be particularly active or have a need to be active. Yeah, because you think about the you know the the fact that the influence of younger people on the parents, the parents still influence the younger people. A lot of households have got older people living in them, you know, three generations. It, it, it's so difficult to, with the breadth of people in terms of how people are consuming media these days, very, very rare that it's as defined as it used to be, I think. Yeah, no, I'd agree. I mean, I think with this particular approach too, it to your point earlier on, it does actually take a bit of time to do some homework. Um, you know, if you don't understand a particular industry or how it works, but you know it might be one that's quite active or or has a need. Any tips for how to how to very quickly sort of get a bit of an awareness of a particular category or industry or vertical? Is there anything that um, you you sort of coach different salespeople around in terms of building out that skill set? Yeah, walk around. Um and keep your eyes open. Um, I, I love when I go to a new country. I'll just I'll spend half a day just wandering through a shopping centre, going through a mall. Yep. You know, just look and see what people are buying, what the shops look like, how different are they to other places. Just keep your eyes open, really. And of course, you know, the one advantage that that I certainly didn't have when I was selling on the street was um, <laughs> the internet. Um, you can get you can research anything so well now. Before you have to think about, you know, you think about, I think Subaru came out with some statistics five or six years ago that said that by, by the time a client walks into a Subaru dealership, they know more about the cars than the people who are selling them. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Because it's just so much information out there. There is no excuse now not to know a lot about the customers before you even approach them. And, and you should, because as I said at the very beginning, if you don't speak their language and start talking to them about what their issues are, you can't possibly even get to pitch point. You know? No one's going to bother talking to you. Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's a really good thing to be reinforced here. And we actually did a, a podcast with Adam Lang, which was around building better business acumen a couple of seasons ago, which I'd encourage anyone who wants to know more about that topic to go and have a listen to. George, I've got a couple of selfish questions for you because I'm fascinated by the business. Um You've been all around the world. You've seen media organisations all around the world. How similar is it? And and what and if if there are, what are some of the unique differences around different territories? Is it is it fundamentally the same? Do we all have the same challenges? Do we all operate relatively the same, or is it unique from from different um, different countries? Jamie, this is going to be the most boring answer to a very good question. <laughs> it is staggering how similar countries are and understand that we're in we go from india to pakistan sri lanka the united emirates us south america you know all over asia it's the same our statistics are almost identical in terms wow. of from the marketing how many rsvps you get how many people turn up how many people buy the package sizes i mean it is staggering um, the other thing that's staggering is it's the same excuses used by salespeople all over the planet as to why they can't succeed. <laughs> it's the same, we, you know, in our training manuals, you know, we, we rarely have to change the objection handling pages. It's the same stuff everywhere. It, it, it's miraculous how it's the same. It really is one big global village. And, and, and I think I can say that with some authority because we, we trade in some pretty disparate places. Um, it's, mate, Sales reps are either great. I mean, every media company we work with have 10 or 15% of the sales department are astonishingly terrific. 30 or 40% of them are very capable, shall we say capable to very capable, and about 40% of them you wouldn't feed. And that, that's pretty much consistent around the world. Is that right? And is there anything about Australia? Because I, I have noticed in my time in media, and just over 11 years, there are a lot of people in Australia who do get cherry picked out of this media market and and put into roles internationally, and obviously Boost being sort of domiciled out of Australia, and a few other companies that are similar to yours in terms of their their kind of proposition. Certainly not at the scale of you guys come from Australia. Is there something about Australia that makes us a market that are quite in demand for this type of kind of media consulting? 
Yeah, I, I think so. Interesting that when I was a kid, I was sent to the US to go and learn the, the radio trade. And without being arrogant about it, not that I probably would have understood much when I was 20, but I don't think I learned much. Australia's media landscape is very sophisticated. I mean, everything from our research to our presentation to the level of the presenters to the, to the you know, you, you look at the, the fact that we've got such high paid um, presenters on television, radio, we've got brilliant um, journalists and, and editors in our newspaper groups. We spend a lot of money on our product, which then means it's well regarded we get very high ad rates compared to most places around the world in terms of CPM. And it's it's regarded around the world. We've got a couple of markets where they, they really, one of the key things they want us around for is the international experience. And they, they make us go to the agent, the local agencies and they bring people in to meet us. And Australia's very highly regarded. And, and for all the right reasons, Australians are very good at this stuff. Yeah, well, it's, it's, I've always been fascinated by it because of a country of our, our relative size you know, in terms of our economy, um, that we might, yeah, actually punch above our weight a bit in this industry. It's sort of like how New Zealand is known for doing really good creative um, out of the creative agencies. It's sort of got a bit of a global a global brand of being quite good in that sense. What about, here was the last question I was going to give you before we sort of wrap up, but I thought this would be interesting too. The next three to five years, right, and I'm taking the long view here, we've been very short-term in terms of probably the last 18 months, but the next three to five years for a media salesperson who wants to prosper and really wants to forge a career and legitimize the profession of media sales, what do you think are going to be some of the key skills that they're going to need to have in order to be able to um, to thrive in the next three to five years? All of the things we've talked about, but tenfold, and don't assume that tomorrow is going to be terrific. I think without being pessimistic, because if you're pessimistic, you won't make it in sales. Yeah. I think we have to work on the basis that the sun is not going to shine for some time. And if and if you treat your portfolio with that sort of respect, and that's everything from looking after your current clients better, over servicing, don't let creative run too long, come up with fresh promotions, come up with ways to keep your customer base happy and continue to prospect and come up with a, a personal way to to whether it's consuming more news or the, the old days, man, I remember when I was at Triple M, I think Sydney in, two, in, in 87 when the financial crisis hit. I think I was sales director. I don't even think we noticed it. You know, like we were just oblivious to it. We just kept on doing what we were doing and charged on. I think that those days are gone. I think you just have to be very savvy and, and very aware and keep your eyes open and figure out talk to people, talk to, to mentors, talk to your sales directors about what are, instead of sitting in a sales meeting having a chit chat about all the great phone calls you made yesterday, figure it, sit in a sales meeting, I, I, I've done it all around the world. I refuse to sit in a sales meeting and have a chat about who we spoke to yesterday. Or All I want to see in a sales meeting is what prop did you present yesterday? What props are you presenting tomorrow? And and what help you need to come up with ideas to put in those props. Yep. Because if you if you come up with the right idea for the right customer, regardless of what the economic situation is, it's going to work. It's just, it's just going to work. There's just no hiding anymore, right? This is all about research and hard work. Um, and you know as well as I do, there are those, those sales people that just are driven and professional and won't take no for an answer. And those that, Want to find an excuse not to? Not to yeah, say. I mean, I think it's a great call. I mean, and to, to me, so much of it is mindset, but so much of it is also, you know, building those habits. Like the the analogy that I kind of would use is, you can set a goal, right? You can set any sort of a goal, but oftentimes it just comes down to then reverse engineering that and going, what are the four or five things I need to do consistently every day with discipline and focus and rigor? that if I do it enough over the next 12 months, I'm going to get to that goal. And I've, I've always found the salespeople that are just consistent in that application of the basics are usually the ones that are, are, are sort of there at the end of the year having a really good good sort of year under their belt. So um, it is interesting just reflecting on the last 18 months. I think it's, 
I, I mean, I don't think I would wish the last 18 months on anyone in business. Certainly the business you and I are both in, I would argue, have both been heavily impacted by COVID more so than, than others. But I would also say that I feel a lot sharper and I think I've got a sharper team for it in the last 18 months. And I feel like we're going to go into the next couple of years with a very, very refined skill set that we've forged through some real adversity. And it's going to make people a lot more commercially savvy and they're going to be a lot more exposed to inefficient systems and processes. And, you know, Boost, by all accounts, sounds like it's a stronger business now than it would have been had we have not had the pandemic, as, as much as I probably hate to say that. I agree, man. I think we probably would have got there, but we wouldn't have got there as quickly as we had. It just accelerated it, yeah. Had to find the solution, and, and thankfully we did. So if anyone from the audience wants to get in touch with you, George, what's the best way for them to reach out and connect? Uh, I'd be delighted to talk to anybody. So probably the easiest thing is just drop me an email. So it's george at boostmedia.com.au. I'll put that email in the show notes and I might also connect your LinkedIn. And um, I really just want to say thanks for spending the, the time with us, George. I know the hours that you work at the moment with consulting around the world and dialing in virtually has you up and awake at all hours of the morning and night. So thank you for making the time to be with us tonight, mate. And uh, I wish you the very best and I look forward to at some point flying down to Sydney and having a beer with you when I'm allowed to do that. That'd be great, Jamie. And I just want to leave everybody with the thought that you know, basically opportunity abounds in, in adversity. So just push on while all your competitors are thriving on excuses. You know, this this is an absolute golden time for those professionals that really want to make a name for themselves to set themselves apart from the chaff. Um, I, I, I can't see a better time for a lot of businesses now to push on. Um, albeit it's going to, there's going to be a lot of bumps and issues along the way. But um, I think um, this is certainly going to weed the poor sales people out and those that are decent at this are going to do very well in the next five years. So enjoy the ride. Fantastic final thought to wrap up on. George, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Jamie. You've been listening to Media Sales Mastery the podcast for media sales professionals. Head to mediasalesmastery.com to help pick the topic, guide the show, and don't forget to subscribe to receive new episodes each week. 